It is. I just said it there. So uh, I just want to say a couple of really important things. First of all, uh, I love the fact that you're recruiting leaders for the next level. You see, this is sometimes we forget about this, but let's say you're here and you want to go here. You have to develop leaders for this level in order to get there. You don't wait. You have to do it in advance. So for children's ministries, for youth or Bible studies, whatever it is, uh, I want you just to listen to what your pastor, Mark Richard, are kind of imploring you to do. And don't sit back and wait. Find your place. Matter of fact, pastor said one of the things that he loves about the church is everybody takes ownership for something, which is awesome. That is great. The second piece of important business is if there's a round rock donut back there, would someone set it aside for me so I can eat it after service? I did not know Round Rock Donuts were here when I walked in the door or I would eat one then. You know, listen, there's two left. OK. Oh, yeah, I'll tell you, that's fantastic. One of each would be fantastic. You know, the thing is, is up in Waxahachie where we live, there's nothing even close to Round Rock Donuts at all. They that's one of the top 10 donut shops in the nation. I don't know if you know that in the whole nation. And uh, so anyway. Yeah, and I think they'll be closed when uh, church is over. So anyway, uh, th thank you. Uh, we're, we're, we're thrilled to be here. And uh, thank you, Lloyd. And, you know, it's great that our paths have crossed multiple times. And uh, thank you for driving to Waxahachie for uh, classes. It's not that far. Just a couple hours, I know. Uh, but uh, anyway, we actually have multiple campuses now. Belton is one of those. Arlington, Fort Worth. Uh, so anyway, there's other campuses for our school of ministry. I want to talk to you today. I want to introduce my wife. First of all, Cindy and I have been married 42 years. Uh, this is Cindy. Cindy, why don't you stand up and greet everybody? Yeah. So Are you going to introduce Harper? Go ahead. Me, I would Harper is nine years old and she's in the fourth grade and uh, we're just delighted she's here. Matter of fact, she's going to help me with the illustration a little bit later in the sermon. So uh, that's great. Uh, you know, uh, I'm going to, if they could bring this called screen up, that would be great. I don't know. I think that's the, maybe the second slide, but uh, I was talking with Pastor Lloyd just before um, service and I said, Lloyd, tell me how you were called the ministry. And he said, actually, I was called as a teenager, which is pretty common, called as a teenager. And uh, but I ran from the call for a while, uh, but then surrendered. And this is an amazing thing. I never cease to be amazed at how God calls people to ministry and to missions. We interview missionaries all the time. And of course, I'm going to speak on missions, but I, I'm amazed at how many missionaries were called as children. And that call never left them. Or those that are called to ministry, called as children or teenagers or youth or adults. 
Uh, we've got three missionaries that were got saved as adults and called as adults. So God, it's the, it's the call that's the critical thing. And so we just believe that God is still calling people to ministry. Amen. And so if you are, if you feel that nudge, I'm not, I'm not recruiting you because God's the only one that can call. But if you sense there's a call, talk to your pastor. You can scan this QR code. That'll take you to a website called IFeelCalled.com. IFeelCalled.com. And it'll walk you through how to do exactly what Pastor Lloyd has done. Go through and get your training to become a credential minister in the Assemblies of God. Listen, we know the Assemblies of God's not the only ship that's floating or sailing in the waters, but it's a great ship. I'm telling you, I'm so appreciative of our fellowship and our movement. And so um, I feel called.com or you can scan that. So I want to talk to you today about the mission of God. The mission of God. The Latin word for that is missio Dei. The mission of God. And, and I know here we are in 2021, and some people think missions is kind of outdated, that it's something of the past. And so I want to pose the question, what is our responsibility regarding missions in this 21st century? What is our responsibility for the Great Commission today in Round Rock, Texas, at North Point Church today? And by the way, Pastor Lloyd mentioned this. I grew up in a church, a very small church. And uh, actually, I think you may be amazed at this. Sometimes we wonder. I, I appreciate Cindy saying you are making a difference. I look back on my life at the people that spoke into my life. There were people that were faithful with what God asked them to do. The church I went to was so small. Sometimes I'd go to youth and I was the only youth that showed up. But you know what? And pal showed up every week ready to teach, whether I was the only one there or were there a handful of us. I'm so thankful for people like Ann Powell. She was a volunteer, and yet she was faithful with what God put in her hand. Interestingly enough, we actually did a survey, just an informal survey of all of the leaders across the Assemblies of God across the nation and all of our districts. 95% of all of our AG leaders came out of small churches. Think about that for a moment. So the mega churches aren't producing our leaders. It's our small churches. And why is that? Because in a small church, you can take ownership for something and God uses that to grow you and teach you. Is that right? Pastor? It is, isn't it? It's right. So I just want to encourage you. You never know who you're influencing or what God's going to use, use you for or use the children and youth that come out of this church. And so um, I got a little sidetrack there. Forgive me. But our responsibility early in our fellowship's history our leader said, the reason we've been baptized in the Holy Spirit. How many of you know that we are Pentecostal? Come on. We speak in tongues. We pray in the Spirit. And uh, our early leaders knew that when they got filled with the Spirit, it just, it just wasn't so we could feel good. Although I'm just telling you, praying in the Spirit and things of the Spirit feel good. I like it. I like getting holy goosebumps sometimes. Anybody else? Come on. But that's not the reason we got filled with the Holy Spirit. We've been filled with the Spirit to give us power to be witnesses. And our early founders knew that. I want you to look at this early AG photo. These 314 people, they got together. And the second meeting that they had, they said, we're going to commit ourselves to the greatest evangelism the world has ever seen. To carry out the greatest evangelism the world has has ever seen. That's pretty ambitious in the natural realm, but why did they say that? They weren't trying to prove anything. They couldn't see down the road where we are today, but they knew that because they'd been empowered with the Holy Spirit, that God was speaking to them about the mission of God, Missio Dei. I should have you say that with me. Say Missio Dei. Missio Dei. Now you can speak Latin. Of course, it's a dead language. Nobody speaks it, but you can speak Latin. So is this commitment that they made, is it still valid today? I'd like for us to consider some vital things about God's word and his mission in the local church. And I want us to look at a, a particular part of the nature of God that just recently I've really come to have a deeper understanding for. You know, we never stop learning in the kingdom, right? We never stop learning. And so I want to talk to you about the sending nature of God. The sending, 
S-E-N-D-I-N-G, the sending nature of God. The sending language that we find in the scripture is amazing. We find it starts in Genesis where God called out and sent Abraham all the way to Revelation. Think about that. Genesis to Revelation, we see this sending nature. Genesis, it's Abraham. And then Revelation, he's sending an angel to proclaim the sending nature of God. And there are hundreds of examples. Actually, this word in the Old Testament, the, the Hebrew word shalak, appears over 800 times. It means to send or to send, sending over 800 times. This is part of God's nature. And this is the part that I hope the Holy Spirit uses to challenge us for us to realize not only is God a God of love, that's the scripture describes him as that, but he is ascending God. That's part of what he does. He sins. For God so loved the world, he sent. Right? He gave his only son. So, sending God. Throughout the Old Testament, God is presented as this sovereign Lord who sends individuals in order to express and complete his mission of redemption. In Isaiah 6, 8, we, we read this passage of scripture. Also, I heard the voice of the Lord saying, read this with me, whom shall I send and who will go for us? Then I said, here am I, send me. This is just one of many, many scriptures that help us understand God is actually saying, who can I send? Who will go? And Isaiah said, here am I, send me. He said, go and tell these people. But one that you're all probably familiar with, if you know the scriptures, Isaiah 61. And this is what we read there. The spirit of the Lord God is upon me because he has anointed me to preach good tidings to the poor. Listen to this. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives and the opening of the prison to those who are bound, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord, to comfort all who mourn, to console those who mourn in Zion, to give them beauty for ashes, the oil of joy for mourning, the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness, that they may be called trees of righteousness, the planting of the Lord. Now, this passage is in Isaiah, but where else is it? It's in the New Testament. Jesus goes to the synagogue and he's going to read. And the scripture says when he goes to read, he finds where it is written. He finds this passage and Jesus reads that passage of scripture and then says today the scripture is fulfilled in your hearing or in your presence. It's just an amazing passage of scripture. And Jesus was claiming this scripture was talking about him. So I, I want us to make sure we don't miss this. Jesus was saying, God has sent me, Jesus talking about himself, to bind up the brokenhearted. He has sent me to proclaim freedom. He has sent me to release dark, from darkness the prisoners. He has sent me to, you, you understand what I'm saying? All of these things that describe the work of Jesus and what Jesus was going to do, they all can start with God had sent him to do these things. God had sent him to proclaim the acceptable, to send him to comfort and sent. We're talking about the sentness of God, the sending nature of God. And we're going to connect that with missions and what God wants us to do. So here's the first point I want us to walk away with today. Number one, when you send out missionaries, when you engage in missions, you are reflecting the very sending nature of of God. God sent his nature. It's expressed when you, North Point Church, sends out missionaries. You're coming into agreement. You're coming into alignment with what God has always done since the history of mankind. And the New Testament model, we just saw, said what Jesus read. The New, Jesus is the New Testament model, right? It is. And so Galatians 4, 4 and 5 says this. But when the set time had fully come, God sent his son. I, I hope you, you're realizing the word sent is in, in so many scriptures that we just pass over it. But it's a core of what God is speaking to us. God sent his son, born of a woman, 
born under the law to redeem those under the law that we might receive adoption to sonship. First John 4, 9. This is how God showed his love among us. He sent his one and only son into the world that we might live through him. This is love. Not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. This means God's very nature and plan are expressed by the sending of people to redeem other people. Jesus set the pattern. Jesus was the model. Have you ever heard this? Jesus was the first missionary. He was. He left his home, went to a different culture. <laughs> Talk about culture shock, heaven to earth. That's a culture shock, right? <clears throat> different language, different customs. He even had to change his essence. He went from divine to human. And it's just, it's a mystery to us, but he was the very first missionary that God the Father sent so that we could be redeemed. God's very nature is expressed by the sending of missionaries. Now, I want to talk about the local church. I want to talk about North Point. Have you ever stopped just to think how important you as a local church are to God's mission, the Missio Dei, the mission of God? We already said the Bible speaks from Genesis revelation of his redemptive work. He's intentional. He's active. He's intimately involved in redeeming creation. And the work flows out of his nature through the power of the Holy Spirit. And this is an amazing thing to me. When God chose to leave his, his work on earth in the hands of, 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 of so, that, so that the whole world would know. I, I, I mean, I, honestly, if I'm God, I'm looking at man. I don't know if I would have trusted mankind with the gospel. I mean, listen, we, and we even look at the history of the church. We've messed up a lot. But God in his faithfulness gets us back on course, gets the church back on course. And the gospel, the seed of that gospel has been preserved throughout generations. And of course, it's the word of God and it's still powerful. But God chose to use you to fulfill the mission of God. He chose the local church. Now, I, 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 there, there, are, there are two institutions, at least two, that didn't come from the mind of man. Government, probably we probably made that up. <laughs> That's why it's so broken, right? Um, <laughs> economics. We've created economics, an economic system. Education. That's, that is a... That is a uh, an institution that man has created, education. But there are two that man didn't think of. One is the family. God created the institution of family. Listen, if we want to change our economic or our educational institutions, we have the right to do that. We don't have the right to change the institution of family because we didn't create it. God did. And the second one is the church. The institution of the church. That wasn't our idea. That was God's idea. And so we got to be really careful that we don't try to change what church is or what the church does. And if I can just tell you, I think there's a great danger today across Western society that the church has been lulled into thinking that what we do is we come to church so we get fed and we forget about the mission of God is why we exist. You are, this mission isn't marginal for God. It's the very heart of his concern. You came to Christ because you became aware that through his mercy, he extended his love to you. And you responded by accepting him as your savior. And if you haven't done that and you're here today, you need to do that before you leave, obviously. And we not only become recipients of his grace, we, we not only become receivers of his grace, but we become participants of extending his grace to others. If I could say it this way, we become the sent ones too. You realize we're talking about sending missionaries, but you're being sent right here to this community. I love the fact all the community outreach. 
I love that. The backpacks, the, 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 well, I don't know the list, but anyway, they were all up there. I think that's incredible to keep looking outward because why? Because God has sent you so that you can be witnesses to this broken and fractured world. So not only are we talking about sending, it's the nature of God, but God is also sending you, even as you send missionaries, God is sending you. I think I'll get to that some more in a minute. Here's the second point, if I could say this about the sending nature of God, is that when you send out missionaries, you're participating in something much larger than yourself, much bigger than yourself. How many of you want to live your life beyond yourself? I do. How many of you want to be a part of something that's bigger than just you as an individual? I do. This is the beautiful thing about the kingdom of God, that we can partner. The, the local church plays this pivotal role in growing and develop the family of God across the street and around the world. Whether you've been a believer for years or, or you've just come to faith in Christ, you're part of this family. You're part of the church, this institution that was God's idea. And you're participating in something much larger than yourself. Even larger than the local church. Not only this participation in God's mission, much larger and farther reaching, it has deep roots in our history. And I just want to help us understand what this means that we're participating in something much larger. Do you realize that your history goes back 2,000 years to the day of Pentecost when the church was born. Whew, that's incredible, isn't it? You know, I, 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 I sometimes we, we just live in the present and we think we're the church and, and, and we, don't think, we don't think it this way, but we know how to do church and this is the modern world and this is how we communicate and all that. But the truth is, when we look back behind us, and we're not going to live in the past, but when we look back behind us, we realize that this, this thread of redemption goes back 2,000, or the church goes back 2,000 years. That's quite a history. So when you become part of the church, you're joining in something that's been going on for two millennia. I mean, we're not talking a flash in the pan. We're not talking a temporary thing. I mean, how many businesses have come and gone? How many governments have come and gone in those 2,000 years? How many rulers and kings and, and dictators and authoritarians, how many of those have come and gone? And yet the church still exists today. The church has existed in every form of government, in every form of leadership, in every form of economic. The church is not relying. We're not dependent upon those things. We utilize them when we can. But thank God we're part of something that's much bigger and broader than any man-made thing at all. We're just not, this is not part of our history. Honestly, we're making history. We're part of making history. Now, I want to tie that down. Not only do we have these 2,000 years of history, but the Assemblies of God, we've got a little over 100 years of history. Now, we're also connected to that here again. God in his amazing, amazing wisdom is allowing us to participate in something that's much bigger than ourselves. Now, I told you the phrase, missio Dei. I'm going to add another Latin word to that, okay? Can you handle one more word? It's the word ice. <laughs> Say it again. Ice. E-I-S. Missio ice Dei. Say that with me. Missio Ice Day. Now, Missio Day is the mission of God. What does Missy, Missio Ice Day mean? It means the mission of God or the sending of God to them. It actually means God is sending us to someone else. God is sending us outside of ourselves so we can participate in something that is much bigger. This is the motive and direction of God's activity centered around Jesus Christ. And listen to what he said in John 20, 21. As the Father has sent me, so I send you. I want you to hear Jesus say those words to you. 
As the Father has sent me, so I am sending you. This helps us understand that God has been actively involved in sending to reach the world. We see it. We've already said it. We see it when he sent his son, Jesus, into the earth. We see it when Jesus sent his disciples out. And now we see it as we pick up that mantle and we become agents to ascent and sending. Everyone, Romans 10 says this, everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Isn't that a great promise? Everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Listen, I know, I know that predestination and Calvinism, you may, may or may not know those terms, but basically that there's this resurgence that only certain people can be saved and they're the elect that God chose. And if you're the elect, you're going to be saved. If you're not the elect, you're condemned and there's nothing you can do. That is not biblical. It's not biblical. For whoever calls on the name, everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Whosoever believeth in me shall not perish but have everlasting life. I mean, this is the promise that anyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. But I love what he says here. How then can they call on the one they've not believed? You see, you got to believe in your heart. It's not just the prayer. It's the belief in the heart. The words that you call on the Lord is merely the confession or profession. But first, you got to believe. And Paul knows that in Romans 10. How can they call on one they've not believed in? And how can they believe in the one whom they've not heard? Paul is employing an incredible literary style here. He's taking us in reverse of the process of coming to Christ. You call on the name of the Lord, but first you got to believe. But before you can believe, you got to hear. If you haven't heard about him, you can't believe and you can't call on him. How can they hear without someone preaching? The Bible even calls it the foolishness of preaching because in some ways it doesn't make sense. And yet it's the, the gospel is the power of God and salvation. And so Paul says, okay, they've got to preach. Someone's got to preach so they can hear, so they can believe, so they can call on Jesus and be saved. But listen, this is what we're talking about today. Verse 15. And how can anyone preach unless they are sent? The sentness of God, the missionary heart of God. God wants every second Peter. God's not willing that any should perish. Why? Because he wants them to come to repentance. You may be asking, so how can I participate in this sending mission of God? First of all, in the local church, you participate in two ways. First of all, you participate in an individual. You participate as an individual. How, how do I participate in the sentness of God, the sending nature of God? You show up at the assignment God's given you. And I don't mean just in the church. I'm talking about where you work Monday through Friday. Or Sunday, Saturday, six, however, where hardly anybody works five, four, five days a week, 40 hours a week, right? We all work more than that now. But whether you are in construction or a student, or a teacher, or a plumber, or an electrician, or whatever your responsibilities, or a stay-at-home mom, or a single mom. It doesn't make any difference. You, you are faithful to the station in life that God has placed you in. You say, well, this wasn't God's will for me to be a single mom. You're right, it wasn't. But God has placed you there now. And now you, you be faithful to the assignment that God has put before you. And realize that I am sent. I've been stationed here. I've been sent by God. You know that Acts 19, I think it is, says that God determines the, size, the times and seasons and determine where every person should live. Isn't that amazing? You mean to tell me that God had something to do with where you live? You better believe it. You mean to tell me God had something to do with your particular career path? You better believe it. You see, there are people in your life that may never walk in the door of North Point Church. So you, as a sent one, are going to take North Point Church to them. You know, there are people that your life will intersect with that Pastor Lloyd's life will never intersect with. 
There are people that you know, and you never know the influence that you're having. So this sentness is not just for missionaries to foreign land. It's for all of us. We're all sent. And I, I, come on, we got to own that this morning. I want you to turn to somebody and say, you have been sent by God to serve where you are. You've been sent by God. And I want you to, to respond to them. Yes, I have been sent by God. I have been sent by God. And so he has, had, that's, that's, that's the first way that you participate in the sending nature of God is you recognize that you're one of the sent ones. Now, second way is this, by sending out missionaries out of your church. Acts chapter 13 describes the Holy Spirit is giving life and to the local church at Antioch in the nation of Syria, talking, calling its members and telling others about the good news. And this church in Antioch, I don't have time to talk about it. It was the first Gentile church outside because Jerusalem, most of those that were getting saved were Jews. The church was primarily Jewish until the church at Antioch. How did the church at Antioch come into existence? You know how it came into existence? Those that were persecuted were scattered throughout all the region. And history tells us that some of those Christians, not the apostles, by the way, they stayed in Jerusalem, the Bible says, but all the other church members, if I could say it that way, were scattered because of the persecution. And some of them apparently ended up in Antioch and began to share the gospel. Why? Because they knew they'd been sent by God. Yes, that's right. They understood they weren't there because the Roman government dispersed them. They were there because God had sent them. And they began sharing the gospel. And people began responding. And so now we see this church. It's called the Church of Antioch. And God, God began to use this church for Antioch. And I'm going to pick up Acts 13. Now at the Church of Antioch, there were prophets and teachers. Barnabas, Simon called Niger, Lucius of Cyrene, Menaean, who had been brought up with Herod, and Saul. While they were worshiping the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I've called them. So after they fasted and prayed, they placed their hands on them and sent them. Oh, I don't, I don't know if I have that up there. And sent them off. Now, I, listen, we can't miss this. We can't miss this because this is foundational. This church that formed because believers like you and me were sharing the gospel as they went about their daily lives. And a church formed out of that in, in the city of Antioch in Syria. And as they worshiped and prayed, God said, I want you to set apart these individuals for the work I've called them to. And so they laid their hands on Paul and Bar I mean, Saul and Barnabas, Paul and Barnabas, Barnabas and Paul, I think his order is there, and sent them off what they do they didn't keep them they did they, what they sent them the sending nature of god we see expressed in this young church in antioch and what we would understand what we'll understand later is that this became the pattern this wasn't the exception this was god saying listen this is how i want the church to function you're going to go about your daily life and I'm going to call certain people to a different work that I've, and you're going to send them out. You're going to send them. As a matter of fact, I'd, I'd like for us to reframe how we think about missionaries. We think about missionaries as us and them sometimes. Us and them. I mean, they're us, but if they're them, can I tell you, if you look at it really from a biblical standpoint, these are our sons and daughters we're sending out. And it could be your son or your daughter or your grandson or your granddaughter. And it's not a us and them. This is all of us reflecting the sending nature of God. So here's the third thing that, uh, and I don't know that my points are all succinct, but here's the third thing that I want us to take away today. When you send out missionaries, you're following the New Testament pattern. You see, our forefathers, even though they committed themselves to the greatest evangelism the world has ever seen, they didn't just make up this idea about sending missionaries. 
This goes back to this 2,000 year history we have. This is God's pattern. They were simply getting in on God's pattern. Now look what they did. So this became a model. So they're supported through prayers. Paul and Barnabas are supported through finances. They're advocates. They're sons and daughters from this local church. They come back after their time of service and they give reports of what God has done on their missionary journey. Does that sound familiar to anybody? Pastor Walt just told me, we're starting to have missionaries come through. And what are these missionaries doing? They're sharing what God has done or going to do as they fulfill this call to be a missionary. So what we do is not just a denominational model, it is a New Testament model that we have that goes back these 2,000 years. Now, I just want to share a few statistics with you. You probably know this. I've probably heard them. But just in the assemblies of God, this New Testament model, today we have over 2,600 missionaries. 2,600 missionaries that are going overseas and about that many that feel called the missions in the USA. That's over 5,000 missionaries out of the assemblies of God. You'll find them in 153 countries throughout Africa, Eurasia, Northern Asia, Asia Pacific, Europe, and Latin America. Over these 110 years, our missionaries have planted over 382,000 local churches. That's how many exist today. Probably planted more than that. But today, as part of this, remember I said, when you participate in missions, you participate in something much bigger than yourself. Can you imagine? You're, you're one of 382,000 churches scattered across the world that are part of the assemblies of God. On average, every 30 seconds, someone comes to Jesus through the assemblies of God. Every 66 minutes, a church, a new AG church is planted somewhere in these countries where we serve. Isn't that amazing? And what started out with these 314 people in, in, uh, in 1914, when they said, we're going to commit ourselves to the greatest evangelism the world has ever seen. Now, today, the Assemblies of God, out of that 314, we number over 69 million people around the world. Oh, come on. Somebody ought to shout. Can't even wrap our mind around 69 million, hardly. 69 million people. That is, that is amazing. 69 million. Why? Because we got on the track to fulfill the sending nature of God. Yes, we, we bought into the Missio Ice Day. The mission of God to send to them. So, what about the future? Now, this is where I'm going to have Harper come help me. I'm going to have to pull some items out here. I want to talk to you about the future. That, that's what we've reached. We celebrate that. But maybe there's still a need to reach people with the gospel. How many of you know that we're not finished with this need of reaching the gospel? So Harper, can you come help me here? Okay, so, okay. So, there's something that we've embraced recently called the Buddhist Hindu priority. And you can go ahead and pour those bags in there one at a time. Actually, you know what, hold on Harper. Hold on just a moment. I can't, I can't, uh, I got ahead of myself. The Buddhist Hindu priority, and we're going to talk about it. But I'm going to use gumballs to help us understand this. Who likes gumballs? Yeah. Each gumball represents one million people. One million. Okay. Why are there three gumballs in here? Because the greater Austin area has almost three million people. Right? So think about that. This represents the greater Austin area. Just think, just, Cindy talked about the traffic. Whew. Three million people creates a lot of traffic, doesn't it? Three million people. Okay. Now, I'm going to leave that there. This is going to represent the state of Texas. That's 30 gumballs. How many, how many million is that? 30 million. I try to make it simple for us. Okay. Even for us that aren't math people, we get it. 30 million people. That's roughly the population of the state of Texas is 30 million. Okay. So what does this represent? 
And what does this represent? Texas. So now, Harper, these orange gumballs, go ahead and start pouring those in there. These orange gumballs represent the Buddhist world. Each bag actually has a hundred gumballs in it. Yeah, you're going to get it. A hundred gumballs. How many people does that represent? A hundred million. A hundred million that are waiting to hear that God is ascending God, that God is sending someone to tell them the gospel. So that that jar represents three hundred million. Harper, you did fantastic. That's awesome. Okay, go ahead and put those in there. We're gonna put that lid on. Yeah. Three hundred million. Six hundred million. 900 million. That's how many Buddhist people are waiting to hear the gospel. Do you you get an idea of the vastness of the need? But we're also focusing in the assemblies of God on the Hindu people. Not just Buddhist. Harper, can you come on this side and begin to pour these gumballs? Yeah, you can come around here. You see, the Buddhist people are primarily in in the Asian countries. The Hindu includes India, includes other places as well. But you're going to see the same thing, that each one of these gumballs represents a million people. This is just an illustration to help us grasp the magnitude of the need that sets before us. And if I could just say this, One of the reasons I'm here today is to advocate for these people. Advocate for these individuals. That's okay. Did we we lose 100 million souls? Yeah. (laughs) Got them right there. There we go. God's not going to lose track of them. You see, these individuals, we may think of Buddhists and we may think of Hindus as, as a challenge and they are broken. But yet God wants to redeem them. Okay, go ahead and put that lid on there. And then Harper, can you pull out those other jars down there? Because just like the Buddhist world, the Hindu world is much bigger than the need is much greater. 1.2 billion Hindus. Between those two religions, Hindus and Buddhists, it's over 2 billion people which is over 25% of the world's population. And we're, we're believing God's raising up missionaries to go to these because these individuals, these people, we've not had a, a, an, an equitable number of missionaries reaching this vast, unreached people. But God's going to help us. Thank you, Harper. Didn't Harper do a great job? So... These individuals may not be aware of it, but they've been created in God's image. They may be broken, but God wants to make them whole. I want to share a testimony about one of these uh, individuals that was from a Hindu family. As a matter of fact, can we bring that photo up? And uh, there's a gentleman in this photo. His name is Om. If you go to the next slide, you'll see Om right there. Om. That's an unusual name. I said, Om, what does your name mean? He said, my parents named me Om. It's the meditation of the Hindus. Om. They were Hindu. Lived in a remote village up by the foothills of the Himalaya mountains. And very, very poor. Om said that, he said, honestly, we were so poor. Every day that we woke up. Our primary thought was, how do I find enough food to live another day? Now, what's interesting is that because they were Hindu, and by the way, Hinduism has 350 million gods. Anything can be a god. 350 million gods. So families adopt these gods. They don't worship all 350 million. They'll worship a few that they think will protect them. So... While Om and his family were on the verge of starving, 
they would make food sacrifices to these false gods. That messed with the kid's mind. You know, we're giving, we're giving food to these, these gods, but they were, you know, they were in the form of idols, and yet we're starving. So anyway, very, very poor, very remote. Anyway, when almost 13, he became very ill. There's no hospital in his village. There's no doctor in his village. So his parents didn't know what to do. Eventually, they took him down the mountain to a larger community to see a doctor. They couldn't figure out what was wrong with him. But Om continued to get worse and worse. He stopped going to school. He basically stayed at home, wasting away. At 13 years of age, he was dying. And one day, he noticed uh, uh, this. they, they lived in a, a mud hut that had mud walls. And he noticed up in the mud wall by a window that there was some kind of opening and there were some books in there, interestingly enough. So he pulled out a book and it was an interesting book and he started reading it. It was the New Testament. And I'll tell you how it got there a little bit later. The New Testament. And Om, 13 years old, very ill, started reading through this book, knowing that his parents worshipped all of these different gods. And he said in his heart, if this God is real, I choose him. He didn't really know to pray the sinner's prayer. No one led him. He just said, if this God is real, I choose him. Well, his parents were obviously, he didn't tell his parents. They didn't know that it happened. They didn't know he'd read the book. So his parents had taken out money. They borrowed money from other people to bring a witch doctor to heal their son. I'm talking about, oh, this guy right here. And so they, this witch doctor came and he had some people that came with him. And uh, Ohm said, it was everything you think of witch doctor. These people, they were doing these incantations, calling on spirits. These people, their eyes would roll back in their head. They start shaking. They fall down on the ground. And this witch doctor was getting frustrated. And finally, after hours, he told his parents, I'm, I'm even trying some some secret uh, incantations for difficult situations, and I don't know what's going on. I want you to listen to me carefully. If, you, if you've ever questioned if there's a spiritual realm, I, I, hope that, I hope that just evaporates right now. So the witch doctor said, I see the spirit that I'm calling on to come inhabit your son. Because that's all they knew. I see him. He's right here. But there's a bright light over your son that is keeping this spirit from entering your son. Isn't that amazing? Well, his parents were distraught. And so the witch doctor, finally out of frustration, leaves after hours and hours, exhausted. And he leaves, and his parents can't figure out what's wrong. They paid lots of money that they borrowed from people so their son, so their spirit could come and heal their son who is dying. And Om tells his mom later, Mom, I think I know what happened. And she tells him, I found this book and it talked about this God. And I said in my heart, if this God is real, I choose him. And I think that was the light that kept the spirit from entering me. His parents got saved. Om got saved. As it turns out, his older brother, who was almost old enough to be his parent, put the book there because he'd been exposed to the gospel, but nobody knew it. And he hid that book in the wall, not knowing anybody would ever find it. But when Om needed it, he found it. Now, we're talking about the sentness of God. We're talking about, you know, God sending. And so, how did that Bible get in the hands of his brother that ended up in that wall? I'm going to tell you how he got there. You just, you just stole my punchline. <laughs> Who did it? Who said missionary? Who said it? Missionary. That's right. By the name of Joseph Gordon. Joseph Gordon was a young missionary that felt called. And he didn't feel called to go to the big cities. He felt called to go to the remote villages. So Joseph would leave his family and he would trek for months through the Himalayan mountains, going village to village, 
sharing the gospel. And he's one of our missionaries. It was Joseph Gordon that was sent by us that put the Bible there for Om to find and come to Christ. The sentness of God. And I believe that there are many, many, many people still waiting to hear. I'm going to conclude this, Pastor. I'm going to, I'm going to land this plane as we say. Are you still with me? Amen. Are you still with me? I, ho- I hope you can tell I'm passionate about the mission of God. I want, I want, this is called a faith promise. Is, do you guys have these? Would you make sure everybody has one of those? I just want to talk to you about a faith promise. What is a faith promise? This is how the Assemblies of God funds missions. This is how our missionaries are sent. This is it. You may have never seen this before. That's okay. I'm going to explain it what it is. A faith promise. There's some more up here if you need some more. Fantastic. This is a faith promise. Cindy and I learned the joy of making faith promises early on in our marriage. 42 years. We've made faith promises annually for years and years and years. And you know what we discovered? We discovered when we listened to the Holy Spirit, God could do much more through us than we thought was possible. You see, a faith promise is a financial commitment and a prayer commitment. But a faith promise is not a pledge. A car loan is a pledge. A house mortgage is a pledge. A faith promise is not a pledge. It's just, it's just something you do by faith. There's no contract you sign. Uh, no one's going to repossess anything. It's just a pledge. It starts with faith. You see, it's not a pledge. Excuse me. It starts with faith. A pledge is based on your finances. A company will loan you money on a car based on how much money you have. They'll loan you money for a house based on your income and your credit and all that. Faith promise is just simply something you do by faith. It's a promise to give as God provides. So here's the thing. In just a few minutes, I'm, I'm going to ask everyone just to, just to pray a simple prayer. And, and it's not like, okay, well, I think I can give this much a month. I mean, I, I love what Richard said. Give up a cup of coffee a week and, you know, you can start supporting. That's awesome. But I think God can do even more than that. And so, so, so a faith promise, it's not about your assets, it's about your heart attitude. It's not really about your budget, it's about your belief in what God wants to do. It's not as much about your checking account as it is the challenge in your heart. It's not as much about your finances as it, about, as, as it is about your faith. So why should I make a faith promise? I think that's a great question, I'm glad you asked it. Why should I make a faith promise? Because it helps you partner with the Missio Dei, the mission of God. We're talking about the sending nature of God, the sentness of God. This helps you partner with God's mission. It helps your church plan. Wouldn't it be awesome if you got to the place where every month your church could have a missionary come and your pastor know that because of the faith promises made in the congregation, they can support some of these missionaries every month. That'd be incredible. You're participating in something that's much bigger than yourself. You're participating in the mission of God. It increases your faith. When you see what God does through you, it increases your faith. This is part of discipleship. It helps you grow. When you make a faith promise, it helps you grow. Why should I make a faith promise? It enlarges the kingdom. The kingdom's enlarged. Why should I make a faith promise? Souls, just like Om, ultimately get saved. Amen. That's right. So, this says, as God enables me, I will help take the message of Jesus into all the world by giving through the missions program in my local church. You can say, I'm going to give so much weekly or so much monthly. I don't know if this is a new or renewed, maybe new for all of you. I don't know if you've accepted faith. Have you ever done this before, received faith promises? You want me to hold off? I can hold off. I'm sorry, Pastor. Okay. Okay. <laughs> so, so, so you, you put your name in there and then you sign it and then you tear off this little piece. You put that on there. 
You keep that and you turn this into the church. Yeah. Now here again, I, I just want to set you at ease. The church will never send you a letter say, hey, you made this, they promise. How come you're not giving it? They're not going to do that. Well, you say, well, then why do I need to fill it out? Because it helps the church plan. And so in just a minute, I'm going to ask you to fill that out. I'm going to lead us in just a simple prayer, asking God to take the lid off of our faith and let God do what he wants to do. I wish I had time just to tell you stories. Cindy and I made a faith promise one time that was hundreds of dollars more than we could even afford. And I thought, I don't know how God's going to I don't know how God's going to do that. And then he brought along an opportunity for us to buy a piece of rental property. We'd never been landlords before. And we bought this piece of rental property. It was just really, it was awesome. And every month that rental property threw off extra cash that allowed us to make our faith promise. Amen. We had no idea where it was coming from. I was so excited. I was so excited because at the end of that 12 months after we finished our faith promise, I just knew we were going to have extra money every month coming in. It all dried up. We ended up having to sell the property. <laughs> but you know what? But God provided supernatural for that faith promise. And I knew that's what it was for. And we understood that. So, Lord, let me just take that, hold it in your hand. I just want to lead us in prayer. Lord Jesus, we want to participate in the mission of God. We want to be a church that sends missionaries. We want to be part of the sending nature. We want to reflect the sending nature of God. And so, Lord... Do what we can't imagine. I declare that God, by faith, you want to give more through this local church, North Point, than they've ever thought possible because of your goodness and your faithfulness. But Lord, we're the vessels that you give through. So help us be men and women of faith right now in Jesus' name. Now, if, if you're here and your spouse isn't here and you need to talk to them, you can do it. But I'd love, I really would challenge you to fill it out right now. Pastor Walty may follow us up. Now, while you're filling that out, I'm going to just leave you with these two principles. Okay? There's, there's two principles that you, are, that you are activating in your life right now. Here's the first one. Only in God's economy can you plant a seed in someone else's field and expect to harvest in your own. I'm going, to, I'm going to say that again because it's good. It's good. Only in God's economy can you plant seed in another person's field and reap a harvest in your own. That's the kingdom, you know. So, how generous can we be with seed we're sowing in someone else's field? And the second is this. When we send workers to sow in another field, we can trust God to multiply workers in our field. That's right. Listen, every, I'm, without exception, every church that I know, without exception, every church that I know that is engaged in missions has been blessed by God. Yeah, man. They've been blessed with property. They've been blessed with leaders. They've been blessed by, with people. They've been blessed with souls. I'm convinced some of the reason that we don't see the breakthroughs as we're not participating in the mission of God like He wants us to. So, we release workers to sow in another field and we trust God to release workers here. Now, this is in my notes, but I'm going to finish this up with this. I believe the sign of a healthy church is when they began to engage in missions and become part of the sending force of the church. When you began to embrace missionaries, that's a sign that the church is healthy and has turned the corner, so to speak, and really with the kingdom vision in the name of Jesus. Okay, do you receive that word today? You got it? If you receive that word, could you just say amen? Amen. 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 Thank you, Pastor Lloyd.